of Everest. But this is no ordinary summit attempt. The team is about to make mountaineering history in their search for evidence of two legendary British climbers who disappeared in 1924. Mountaineering's most enduring mystery is whether or not George Mallory and Sandy Irvin were the first climbers ever to reach the summit of Everest. elevation I've been is 23 and a half thousand feet but coming here to Everest there's a huge unknown between 23 and a half thousand feet and 29,000 feet how am I going to do up there and you can always go into these things thinking oh, I'm going to be really strong and I'm fit and I'm confident and everything like this but there's a certain element of my own physiology that I don't know about the physical problems of climbing Everest are First of all, the obvious things like avalanche or frostbitten fingers. But there's other things like um, cerebral hemorrhage, you could have a stroke or even a heart attack. It's very tough on the body and, and it's also tough on the soul when you come back down. For, for weeks afterwards you feel quite weird and uh, your family don't really recognise you. Well, to me what makes Everest special is surely its history. Especially the north face of Everest uh, has a long history of exploration and it holds one of the greatest mysteries in mountaineering and that's what draws me to it. What really draws me to this particular expedition is this hunt for Mallory and Irving. You know, to climb this mountain again, I've been here enough, I know how to climb it to try and get inside somebody else's head and to try and touch a piece of history. That is utterly fascinating to me. You have a primitive attempt to do a huge undertaking. And any of those experiences just charges my batteries up because mankind is having to rely on the human spirit alone not on technology and I think nowadays we are so heavy on technology we lose the spirit end of it and we we don't have the heart and soul this is the wrong book monastery the world's highest religious community and a place of pilgrimage for devout Buddhists. Yet the monastery was unknown to the Western world before Mallory and the other expedition members first came here in 1921. Ever since, it's become a place where climbers come to pay their respects before taking on the challenge of Everest. different in this picture, huh? That looks really remarkable. Looks like they are on the way in to yeah. just before arriving at base camp. Yeah. You know what really strikes me? How, how, how young and energetic George looks in that, in that picture. He, he certainly looks different than the other. Yeah. He is not younger than the others, but... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Shows again my, what a remarkable man he was. George Mallory was born in 1886 in Cheshire, the eldest son of a Church of England clergyman. He developed his passion for climbing at public school in Winchester, and after going to Cambridge, he became a teacher at another English public school, Charterhouse. It was here that he met Ruth Turner. After a whirlwind romance, they married in July 1914. 
Mallory was invited to join the 1921 reconnaissance to Everest, and he returned in 1922 and again in 1924. By this time, he was the only climber who'd been on all three expeditions. I'm absolutely convinced that George Mallory climbed Everest back in 1924. I've got good reasons. First of all, they were seen going strongly for the top by Noel O'Dell. Secondly, they had good weather and they had oxygen. Uh, thirdly, this was Mallory's last time on Everest. He just had to do something with his life. He, he was surrounded by other men in the climbing team who are very accomplished professional men. He hadn't really had a, a chance to fulfill his sort of early promise. And I think this is his big thing. And I think, fourthly, um, the spirit of the age was one of self-sacrifice. They just had a, a lot of um, deaths in the first war. And um, I feel that Mallory felt this is something worth dying for. It was his third attempt on Everest. And it was clearly his last attempt because at the age of 38, um, he wouldn't have stood a high chance to be selected for another expedition. So I can imagine that he was in for an all-out effort on that final day. And I like the analogy with Sir Galahad, who disappeared when he touched the Holy Grail. I would guess he was very much in that mind, now it's all or nothing on this day. George Mallory chose Andrew Urban, the youngest member of the expedition, to join him on his final attempt on the summit. Urban had little experience as a climber, but he was skilled at maintaining the fickle oxygen equipment that Mallory realized was the secret to reaching the summit. This is the last photograph of the two climbers, taken on the 6th of June, 1924. Two days later, they were dead. One of the main objectives of this expedition is to recover a camera which George Mallory took with him to the top. If it's found, the negative could prove whether Mallory and Urban really were the first to reach the summit, 29 years before Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tensing. When I was a boy of 12, I met Howard Somerville, who was my great uncle. Now, he was a great friend of Mallory's and climbing companion. Back in 1924, he had just had his summit attempt, got up to 28,000 feet, and taken a photograph on a little camera of his own. He came back down, exhausted, met up with George Mallory on the North Coal, and George said, I've forgotten my camera, can I borrow yours? Now, Mallory was notoriously forgetful, and uh, this wasn't, you know, unexpected. So, Uncle uh, Somerville fished out his own VPK Kodak and handed it over. You pull out the bellows like this, and what you've got is a variable aperture with four different holes over the lens. The viewfinder is here, so you look down and you take a picture by pressing this shutter release. And this is what we're hoping to find up there. It's very small. And I'm hoping it'll be found in a pocket like this. Noel Adell was the last person to see Mallory and Irvin alive. He saw them shortly after midday on the 8th of June, just a few hundred feet from the summit, and still going as strong for the top. Clouds then rolled in, and they were never seen again. The next British expedition in 1933 recovered an ice axe which belonged to Andrew Irving. It was found high on the northeast ridge, but nobody could be sure whether it was dropped or if it marked the site of an accident. The advance party set up base camp in a glacier valley at Rongbuk Monastery. Then, in 1975, the Chinese organized their own expedition to the mountain. High on the north face of Everest, one of the climbers, Wang Hongbao, made an astonishing discovery. Shortly before he died, Wang told his story to his Japanese climbing partner. He'd been a member of the first Chinese attempt to the summit in 1975. On the way, at about 8,150 meters, at the foot of a rock, he found the old remains of an Englishman. He was lying on his side. His clothes were very old, and if you took a pinch, you could blow it away. The remains were that old. There was a hole in the side of his face 
big enough to put your fingers in, he'd found the really old remains of an Englishman. To people who climb Everest, the Mallory and Irvine disaster is legendary. If there really is a body that old at 8,150 meters, it could only be Mallory's or Irvine's. So I was really astonished. From where we are, above the Rongbuk base camp, we can recognize the major features of Mallory and Irvine's climb in 1924. Uh, they set off on 6th of June, spent the night at Camp 5, continued their climb up the North Ridge to Camp 6 at 27,000 feet. On their summit attempt, they traversed over to the crest of the Northeast Ridge where three obstacles barred their way to the summit. The first step, the second step, and right under the summit pyramid, the third step. Of those, the second step is the most prominent and most difficult. However, in 1933, Irvin's ice axe was found east of the first step. But many people believe that Irvin must have fallen from this point down the north face to the foot of the yellow band where the face flattens out. This assumption was confirmed by the report of a Chinese climber said to have come across the body of a pre-war English climber 10 minutes walk from his tent. The problem is no one knew where this camp was. So by aligning topographical features of the upper mountain visible in the photograph and projecting these alignments on a map, I determined the position of the Chinese camp. So I believe it's right there in the middle of the north face at 27,000 feet. With the search area so close to the summit, it only fueled the debate whether Mallory and Irvin made it to the top before they died. Odell sighting, a good level of credibility. They must have been at least at the second step, if not on the third step. And if they were that high at 12.50, they would have stood a very good chance to have made the summit. I, I don't agree to pin it all on what Odell saw and when he saw it. I don't know. I think that's I think that's loose for, for basing this on. First of all, Odell had very good eyesight. He was a trained observer. Um, he didn't wear spectacles until his 90s. He was he was had very good eyesight. Secondly, um, we know they had good weather and they had oxygen. Thirdly, we know that this is Mallory's last attempt. You know, and he wasn't going to come back to Everest. And I think he just had that impetus to get up over the second step and go. <laughs> In, in my opinion, I think that uh, it, it's hard to imagine that Mallory could have climbed the second step. I rem recall that it was very steep and intimidating and difficult. However, he was a superb climber for his day, and there certainly is a chance that he could have done it. I can't imagine that Irvine could have done it. I could see myself getting exactly that situation. Get up, get up the crux of the climb, hanging on the very upper part of that second step and going, oh, what have I done? Because it's all loose up there. And at that point, what do you do? I don't know. I guess you go for the top and hope something happens. Hope, hope there's a better way down. You, know, you don't just jump off a cliff right there. So, might as well give it a shot. So, of course, I mean, any rational thinking man would know that he made it. You well, guys who don't think you made her are just <laughs> all tied up in knots. Just relax, you made it! <laughs> Everest is a sacred mountain for Tibetans. They call it Chamalangma, which means Mother Goddess of the Earth. So before they leave base camp, the climbers and Sherpas join together in a time-honored puja ceremony to placate the mountain gods 
and bring good fortune to the expedition. taken from base camp by modern expeditions is the same as that pioneered by George Mallory and his fellow climbers in the 1920s. The climbers trek three miles south down the Rongbuk Valley before turning east towards the East Rongbuk Glacier. Mallory's team stopped overnight in the side valley but today most expeditions continue further up the glacier and spend the night at intermediate camp. The second day involves a long trek up the East Rongbuk Glacier, past the old Camp 2 used in Mallory's day, and on to Camp 3, or Advanced Base Camp. Camp 3 is situated at the head of the East Rongbuk Glacier, at 21,000 feet. From here, the route goes up the North Col to Camp 4, at 23,000 feet, then up the Snow Ridge to Camp 5, and further still to Camp 6, perched at 27,000 feet. A few hundred yards to the west is where the climbers expect to find the body of the dead English climber, discovered in 1975. Climbing team have reached advanced base camp and are preparing to tackle the massive ice climb up the North Col. This is where the real climbing begins. The climb up the North Col is the beginning of a long stage of moving equipment, food and oxygen up to Camp 4. And then further up the mountain to the higher camps. It's a laborious and exhausting process for the climbers. But the exercise and the time spent at high altitude is an essential part of acclimatization and will enable them to go higher up the mountain in the weeks to come. now and it's really um, paying off all that acclimatization and taking our time uh, all the time we've spent sitting around at ABC and our carries up to here and uh, really paid off um, gosh it's three times if not five times as easy as it was the first time Compared to the first time up here, it's amazing how much stronger you feel. And it just goes to prove that the old adage that the best thing for altitude is time really rings true. And there's not much that uh, one can do to make it better than uh, just spending time at the various elevations and underachieving so you can overachieve later. Acclimatization is an uncertain process. 
Lower down the mountain, Graham Hoyland has suddenly been taken ill at advanced base camp. He's immediately put on oxygen and taken down to a lower altitude. But he now faces a difficult decision. Either he stays on the expedition and runs the risk of his condition becoming much more serious, or he gives up his ambition of a lifetime and leaves base camp altogether. As I approached the tents, the left side of my mouth went numb, and then I lost all feeling my left leg, my left foot, and uh, I thought, oh no, I'm having a cerebral hemorrhage, a stroke. I got to the tents, sat down, had tea, felt a bit better, but in the morning, uh, my left foot was still numb and it was decided that I should come down on oxygen and return here to base camp. I can't tell you how disappointed I am. I mean I've been planning this trip since I was a boy of 12. You know we've got a, a very strong team here. You know I get up to 21,500 feet which is a, a, a small height really and I have problems. I, I was really surprised because I've had not had trouble going to altitude before. Indeed, I went to the summit six years ago with, with no particular problems. So I'm extremely disappointed. Um, I just hope that everybody else can, can carry on and, and find what we have to find. George Mallory came here three times and, and, and died. And uh, oddly enough, it, this is my third time in Everest. And although I wanted to come and find out what happened to Mallory, part of me was really scared about coming this time. Everest is a very dangerous place. George Mallory came here to make his name, and he did. But, uh, you know, I've got more in my life, and I'd rather go home. Since 1924, over 160 climbers have died high on the slopes of Everest. Their bodies still lie on the mountain, an average of one in every six who attempt the summit. The climbing team are well aware of the risks involved, and as the search day gets closer, their planning becomes more detailed. Locating the camp is purely a help. Reference. A reference, to find a reference point from where to start the search for the body. The search for the body is the main objective. I think the other reference then has to be that the body's been there at least 50 years. And so no need to look where that slope gets steeper because it'd be slid off. Yeah. I Right there. If you found the body in 19... I can imagine where it's... 8,150 meters. It does an avalanche. Yeah. If it's there, then we put enough people up there, yeah. and, you know, we've got any energy left, I, I think we should find it. This year of any years, I think uh, the body should be exposed, judging on what we found already. There's just not much snow up there. Doing our grid is perhaps go all the way up to our high point, have some tea, and then organize how we're going to do it, and then go downhill. Because if we're going to try to search going uphill, it's going to be it's a little bit more futile than if we were going downhill because we'll be preoccupied with. My thinking has always been that we're going to end up searching horizontally yeah. because going up and down there, you just run into these these little ledge systems all the time you know, hitting them at the wrong angle. At the end of April, the climbers move up towards Camp 4 once again. But this time, it's in preparation for the search for the body and the camera on the north base. Some members of our expedition team may have some personal reservations about searching for bodies on Mount Everest. I think we all agree that uh, to be able to contribute additional information to what is the the mystery of the mountain uh, is ultimately uh, going to contribute to a better understanding of the mountain and its human history. I think we all think that if we can do a good job at it, it'll uh, stand up to scrutiny. This next week we move up for our third foray onto the mountain. The team members now are beginning to get well acclimatized. We've established our Camp 5 at 7,800 meters. We hope to spend some time in the search area and also to establish our Camp 6.
this is about time and how much time you got. It's not about that. The main thing is about calories and how many calories you're gonna burn. It's about water. Man, this air sucks the water out of you. And it's trying to maintain enough water and make up enough to replace what you've lost over the course of the day. It is it's a fair struggle. Just getting the water in and not losing off too much water either. You know, you got kind of uh, two questions in my mind is can I handle it um, mentally because it's so slow and physically it's a long day, but it's, it's nothing out of the ordinary. Um, it is slow, and you move so slow in that kind of terrain based on uh, your expectations. And if I can just drop the expectations and the desire to be able to move faster, then man, it's so much better. at Camp 5 and uh, I'll tell you I had a hard day getting here but uh, I want to make sure this stuff works right got a regulator valve it's under 3,000 psi so it comes out hard and then gently 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 this is no muscle man job we slip on the regulator I can turn this on so all that pressure of 3,000 psi He's being regulated down to a breathing rate here. I stick this on, the hose. I take my mask on. And then I'm about to, this will keep me uh, sleeping comfortable. My legs are gonna recover quicker. And uh, all in all, I'm gonna feel a lot better. I know this, but I put my overboot on wrong again. 25,200 feet. The red on the outside, it's not that hard to remember. But these are the kind of basic decisions that you're fighting there with. It's a different world up here. And if I can just get on my feet. Putting your crampons on and your harness. Now I gotta get my lipstick on. Ah. Every time I tie my shoe, I split my finger open a little bit more. And these aren't big hurdles, but they're the little things that kind of are making it hard to get out of tent. Out of tent. We're heading up to see what we can find. And it's kind of being motivated by uh, a massive rainfall in the Indian Ocean. That could potentially be the, the monsoon starting. As well as there are quite a few folks in other expeditions that would love to scoop us on this thing and find us. And the uh, search site is not too far from the high camp. So for that reason, with dry conditions, we think it's worth the gamble. of May 1999. The team leave Camp 5 and climb high up on the north face of Everest to begin their search. If they can only find the remains of the Chinese camp, then Andrew Irvin's body should be close by, somewhere under the fall line of his ice axe. I was looking for an area where I'd assume that a body could rest for 75 years on 45 degree slopes that must avalanche. So I was looking primarily on benches 
all around the north face as we walked around and we all tried to split up and get far enough apart that none of us were in the zone which another person could visually search in um, and I was pretty much in the middle of what I thought was the search area walking around found some old mittens you know old pieces of junk and Andy was way up high up um, in a cool bar going into the yellow band and Conrad was way down below basically where the north face cliffs out um, just under 27,000 feet and uh, Andy at one point yelled down on her on the radio said Conrad you know keep in mind uh, Wang only walked 20 minutes from camp 6 and you're way out of that range. My hunch on it was you'd walk downhill until you're like realize well I'm a little ways away from camp and then hike up. So if you're hiking downhill you can cover a fair amount of terrain. So we got on the to find rib where the camp was and below that I saw a corpse and I went and looked at this corpse and ascertained pretty quickly within getting to 30 feet of this person that it was a modern person due to the equipment and the clothing that this person had. But this was a real interesting clue for me because I saw how this person was in relationship to the rock and certain collection zones. I've seen it on big mountains where people material funnels to a certain point. So seeing this first deceased person was a real clue. I was going, what would the mountain naturally do? What would something that was carried away in the mountain, where would it lie? I started going back uphill and eventually I saw a blue and yellow object fluttering in the wind. I didn't know what that was, so I saw that and I became, I go, I'm gonna go and go look at this. So I was looking up at this yellow thing and I looked over to my right and all of a sudden I saw a patch of white that wasn't rock and it wasn't snow. And I've all of a sudden, then, hmm, I'm gonna go look over here. And as I started traversing closer to this, I saw what appeared to be the lower part of a leg and it was a heel. And I ascertained it was an old body, hobnail boots, natural fiber clothing, it all worn away. And it was just, it was uh, his bare upper back was there, his torso was exposed to the elements. So I called over the radio and my first radio transmission was, last time I tried a boulder problem in hobnail boots I fell off. I heard out of my radio, which was in my down suit, I just heard hobnail boot, quickly unzipped it and said, what? I could see Conrad waving like this down on this, uh, black bench. Jake started moving down and I didn't know if the other people had picked up that transmission because we had to keep our radios inside the down suits so they stay warm and they work. So my next transmission was let's everyone get together down here for Snickers and tea. The radio calls started coming in about hobnail boots and Snickers and tea and you know with all the effort to pick up the radio I just was gonna blow it off until uh, Tap came across and said Andy Politz I need to talk to you on the radio something very blunt like that um, we had decided that once we made any contact we'd as quickly as possible go into radio silence because of the security of the radio calls and we knew other expeditions were listening and we knew that everybody in Nepal could hear us. Once you find this man on the mountain, well then you should be able to very easily go through everything he has, right? And that, that wasn't the case. I mean, should we be doing this? You know, I mean, this, this is a man we respect. This is a dead man. I kept telling myself and then telling the others, well, no, it, it, here, we are disturbing him now. Let's, let's see if we can make this productive. Let's see if we can tell his story, which I think would have been important to him. And let's see if we can do it once and not have to do it again. His body appears to be mummified. There's rope around his waist. Oh, still some socks. You can see a boot. Second boot appears to be on his foot. You can see the metal 
cocks, bottom of his boot, and that boot, that leg is angulated, angulated fracture, so first guess is that he took a fall. Again, you can see rope around his body. Okay, over on this side, you can see his layers, his wool sweater, long underwear, cotton. So you got a cut here. This was here before he started. Thumb split just exactly where mine is. Okay, these are the collar. The, here, here, wait, this is George Mallory. Really? George Mallory. Oh my god. Oh my god. See that? George Mallory. Oh my god. We expected that this is Andrew. Following that story uh, below the ice axe. Andrew brings ice axe. However, we just found a shirt with a George Mallory tag on it. And I'll tell you, it blows you away. Now that doesn't mean this is George. Maybe Andrew's borrowing one of his shirts. Still, it does. It, it, it places it in the right period. And it's, uh, it's the real thing here. Well, blew me away. George Mallory. We didn't find the camera. We looked fairly hard. All due respect is shown by us having had to disturb the body of George Mallory. I'd like to say Psalm 103. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger, and of great goodness. As a father is tender towards his children, so is the Lord tender to those who fear, for he knows of what we are made. He remembers. This guy was a really talented climber. It took a, a great degree of skill and confidence to go with that limited amount of gear to that distance. What Mallory did and Irvine presumably did uh, was just phenomenal. You could sense something of his determination. I, I could. And, and I found myself coming away from it thinking, well, maybe he did some it. In 1924, it took nearly two weeks for the report of the climbers' deaths to reach London. The country was shocked by the news. Seventy-five years later, George Mallory again became headline news, this time within hours. The world was fascinated by the story. But had they reached the summit? Without finding the camera, the last hope now lay in the personal effects found on his body. Could they somehow offer a clue to what might have happened? It was very difficult at the scene to, to distinguish one layer from another because they were kind of discontinuous. Except like on his arms liquid. where there were about seven to nine layers. Incredible. Very fine layers though. You know, cotton and wool. But, uh, but all of it adding up to not even a quarter inch, you know. Look at all the blood. Yeah. These wounds, there were flesh wounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was a sock. So, look at that. Not very thick. You wonder if it's lost a little thickness over the years, but they, they sure, all of it just feels so bit. fine. Now, here's something yeah. that you found on the hill without opening. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we could tell there was something in there. Now what would that be? 
Zinc oxide, zinc oxide I zinc bet. Ah, okay. <laughs> it might be the Sunscreen. same stuff Sunscreen. that was in here. Does it have a I, smell, Dick? Does it? Uh, not, why don't you try it? I can't detect it if it does. Looks like they ripped it in half and shared it. Smells it smells like, yeah, sunscreen. Here was what we considered a pretty key find while we were up on the hill. When Jake pulled these out of his pocket, that meant that they were climbing down after the sun had gotten down. So they're coming, well, we're assuming from this that they were coming down when they fell. And, yeah. and if it was a spare, that, that theory is no good, but the, the reason that that's hard to figure on is he's got such a sparsity yeah. of gear. It's hard to imagine him carrying a, a second pair of glasses. This was one of the first things we found. You, you yeah, found yeah. the label first that said George Mallory. But, uh, I, you know, I can remember you know, reading about him taking an altimeter, and it does go to 30,000 feet which uh, in 1924 must have been somewhat unique. Probably since people didn't go that high, I doubt the instruments did. It says Kerry, London, compensated. The glass was broken out when we found it and no, no hands. Yeah. I think we all thought we were gonna look at it and solve yeah. the riddle yeah. right there, you know. <laughs> but that's a... M E E number two. Wow. Mount Everest expedition number two. Yeah, it's handy. They great. probably made a couple uh, special just for the for the nineteen twenty four yeah. trip. Now we come the piece de resistance. These papers were in pretty good condition. Um, yeah. amazing condition considering the environment, but yeah, definitely. Uh, there were these matches that you pulled out. Yeah. Looking just fine. Okay, and he had these notes folded up in this fine bandana. When Jake pulled this out, there was a, no no longer any question who we were with. George Lee Mallory. It's been uh, forwarded about a million times. <laughs> yeah. Written April 2nd, 1924. My dear George, <coughs> many thanks for your PC. Both children had flu about a week after I had it. Was it fun? I think. Good luck to you. Your affectionate brother Trafford. The people that were really important to him. A telegram? This is incredible. It's in your <laughs> it is. Yeah. March 1924. Two pairs of five gloves. One dozen balls. Balls. One pair of five gloves. Bunch of kindly return this account with remittance. It's an unpaid bill. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. The new evidence found on Mallory's body gives us a much better idea of what actually happened to the two climbers in 1924. We know they left Camp 4 on the North Col on the 6th of June. They climbed the long snow slope up to Camp 5 at 25,300 feet, taking with them enough food and oxygen to last several days on the mountain. The next morning, Mallory and Irvin moved up to Camp 6 at approximately 27,000 feet, where they spent their last night alive on the mountain. Sometime during the early morning of the 8th of June, they left for their final attempt on the summit. After having climbed the route, there are a lot of questions that come up in my mind about Mallory and Irvine and what they climbed. Here's George and Sandy 
We don't know what time they left from Camp 6, but it was a little bit later than they anticipated. One of these had forgotten their head torches, which means that the, the light was already up. And they'd climbed through the yellow band, and it's very difficult up there. It's not an easy, moderate snow slope the whole way. So I imagine for the climbers in 1924, it was a, a really big challenge, the yellow band. Judging from the fact that his goggles were in his pocket and not on his head, it was in the evening or towards dusk that they were descending. It's at this section during the descent that I believe that Mallory fell. It was a straight line from there. I believe he was low down in the yellow band on the descent and he took a fall and he spent his last moments sliding down the hill clawing with his fingers which is a standard technique if you drop your ice axe and I don't believe Andrew maybe even fell at the same time because there had to be something absolutely immobile that the rope was wrapped around and broke. This scenario leaves Andrew Irvin alone on the mountain having watched his companion fall to his death down the north face. Irvin could not have survived for long in the open, and he must have died sometime during that night. But the question still remains, did George Mallory lead the first successful attempt on the summit? The guy obviously didn't let good sense get in the way of his, his determination. He was. Uh, let's face it, he was ready to die trying to do this. And so, yeah, it, my mind has changed. He might have done it. As much as I wish I could just say, George and Sandy, you climbed Everest, the highest peak in the world. You were the first ones to do it. I find that given the severity and the technical requirements of this route, and the standard of climbing in 1924, I, I find it improbable. I believe Mallory could have climbed it, and I think just enough of a wild man that he might have just had a good day that day and pulled it off. Just seeing his strength, his, you know, his obvious tenacity even, and you know, you could see it after 75 years, um, he was determined, and he was tough, and he was strong, and I think, I think he made it. I think I think he and Irvine both made it. <laughs>